Good morning. This is Barry Knapp with Ironsides Macroeconomics. It's shortly after uh, 8 a.m. Mountain Time on Monday morning, August 5th. We're in the midst of a um, outright market panic. We waited until the ISM Services um, July report was released before recording this because we thought um, uh, that could provide either more fodder for our view that the economy has uh, entered into something of a regime change, a decidedly weaker growth outlook, which in, in particular around the labor market, something we've been talking about for months now, um, and uh, the chickens came home to roost on that. We didn't get a weaker ISM services survey. It actually bounced a little bit, which creates its own set of complexities because that'll mean FOMC officials will be less inclined to um, respond to the weaker economic outlook, which we think they broadly misunderstand and have misdiagnosed. Um, so let's, uh, let's work through uh, what we wrote this week and what's happening in the markets. If you're watching the video version of this, we've put up as our background our measures of risk. And um, you can see that um, we took this about 15 minutes after the market opened. The VIX was at 46, which is three and a half standard deviations above its long term mean and extreme level. The VOL of VOL index was at um, 156. That's four standard deviations above its longer term mean, again, an extreme level. The term structure, which is um, uh, one month VIX futures, less the six month VIX futures, the way we measure it. That was 2.6 standard deviations above its long-term mean, eight uh, percentage points inverted. The skew index has been elevated, that remained elevated. Implied correlation still looks low uh, at 33%. That's the correlation of the constituents, the top 50 can, components of the S&P 500. 33 is historically still low, but up from an all-time low at 13%, so quite a jump in um, uh, in correlation. And then the what we call the melt up risk, which is the implied correlation of call out of the money call options versus less the correlation of out of the money put options is actually at melt down levels um, rather than melt up levels, something we saw uh, over the last couple of years where the market was more prone to melt up risk than melt down. So it's pretty prone to meltdown risk now. So this is a real extreme, these are extreme readings. Um, the issue we have, we have reached our approximate 10% pullback objective, or we were close to it at least this morning. And we got extreme readings on this, um, our way of thinking about sentiment, which is the price people pay is more important than what they say. So we're all at sort of our objectives, extreme readings, but the problem is timing and um, the very nature of the problem here. We had a post last night on Twitter that um, is about as close to a viral post as we've ever had, where we talked about the nature of the Fed policy mistake. And um, we don't view not cutting last week 25 basis points as all that big a policy mistake. Our policy mistake runs all the way back to early 2022, something we were talking uh, a lot about with all of you, of course, but um, on television, we discussed it with Becky Quick in December of 2021 about how we thought the Fed should go about their, their tightening process. Given that their easing was primarily through the balance sheet, the amount of treasuries and mortgages they bought was the equivalent of about 250 basis points of rate cuts in terms of the various analysis we've seen of how many bond purchases, roughly 560 billion is the equivalent of a 25 basis point rate cut. Um, and they cut rates only 150 basis points. We thought when they tightened, they needed to be symmetrical and they needed to be far more aggressive with their unwinding of the balance sheet than they ultimately decided to be. So this passive unwinding of the balance sheet and aggressive rate hikes caused the deepest yield curve inversion since the Volcker era. Now, we've heard people dunking on that as a recession indicator, that is the inverted yield curve for a couple of years now, 
but it caused some deep seated problems. It's related to these carry trade issues and it kept longer term rates, which is the most important price in the capital market system, lower than it would have been otherwise. It, it uh, really created a supply problem for credit to small businesses and it created a real, the, the aggressive rate hikes caused a real significant cost of capital increase for small businesses that fo uh, finance at floating rates. Now that problem in the small business sector was less evident to FOMC participants and market participants for that matter, because we don't measure it very well. In fact, uh, if you think about the monthly employment reports, the government really has no idea how many business deaths there are for nine months until nine months after that initial uh, estimate of what's going on with job creation month to month because they have to go through IRS records. That's known as the quarterly census and employment and wages um, report. And it's complex and it, uh, it in, on balance, roughly half of the jobs that have been created during this expansion have been created through this birth death model that just makes an assumption about business deaths. Now, it appears when we get the first estimate of the benchmark annual benchmark revision to payrolls on August 21st, right before Jackson Hole, that um, it's likely we created a million fewer jobs in the year ended last March. And so, again, to wrap all this up, the Fed's been looking at flawed data, um, assuming the economy was stronger than it was. In the meantime, they're totally suboptimal, big time policy mistake in our view about the way they implemented the policy tightening has put a huge squeeze on small businesses, really wrecked the foundation of the labor market or damaged the foundation. Wrecked is a little bit hyperbolic, but damaged the foundation. And the labor market weakening that we saw on Friday in Friday's employment report, but not just Friday's employment report. When we dug through the Jolts report, we looked at the conference board labor differential, which by the way, led us to forecast a four and a quarter percent U3 unemployment rate and 7.8% U6 underemployment rate, as well as the employment cost index that showed private sector wage growth coming down sharply. The increase we've seen in jobless claims, the persistent pattern of negative revisions in payroll reports through the course of this year, and an increase in the unemployment rate from a low of 3.4% back in the first quarter of 23 to four and a quarter percent today. None of this just is a single print. It wasn't just an aberration on Friday related to Hurricane Barrel. This has been building for some time. And um, the very change in recognition that growth was slowing was at the core of the big move in dollar yen that started you know, some three weeks or so ago and has just led to this series of shocks in the financial markets. The short covering rally in the Russell 2000, in the KRE, the smaller bank index, the drop in tech stocks, the move in yen, the drop in the Nikkei, these are all warning signs. When you have a regime change and the US economic outlook, which the whole world revolves around because the whole world revolves around monetary policy coming from the Federal Reserve, these are warning signs. And we don't have the personnel at the Fed to really recognize this, but they, they couldn't have just fixed it on Wednesday. Again, the problem runs much deeper than that, and it's because of the very nature of what they've done. So can they resolve the problem by cutting rates to 4%? It'll go some ways towards uh, disinverting the curve and starting to resolve the problem. But of course, the curve is getting even more inverted here um, as measured by the three-month bill versus the 10-year note. And it will take some time for deposit costs to adjust, even if the Fed does wind up cutting as aggressively as, say, JP Morgan's economist is now forecasting after Friday's report, which would be 50 in SEP, 50 in NOVE, and 25 more in December. The problems are still going to take some, some ways to work themselves out through the small business sector. So um, we are left with a, um, a, a very interesting, precarious spot. Uh, as as it pertains to the report this week, which obviously was written before 
um, the meltdown in, on Sunday night, the 12.4% drop in the Nikkei, the biggest drop since the crash of 87 and the drop in crypto over the weekend. Um, the way we laid out the note was the chickens coming home to roost, which was our uh, assessment of the labor market. Of course, those of you that are you know, full subscribers to our research would have seen the preview note we put out on Wednesday and our expectation that things were, were not going to be pretty on Friday morning. We then went and talked about negative labor market convexity and how the beverage curve that relates job openings to the unemployment rate. We actually think those job openings are overstated because of similar problems with estimating small business uh, employment and, and job openings and this birth death model issue. Um, and the Phillips curve, which relates wage growth to unemployment, those are at the maximum point of con negative convexity, meaning any further weakening of demand for labor will cause a very sharp increase in the unemployment rate. And the Fed, this is the whole point of the SOM rule. The recession indicator stuff, Powell dunking on that last Wednesday uh, to us was, for lack of a better word, infuriating because it's all about rate of change. When the, what the SOM rule really signals is once the unemployment rate goes up 50 basis points or a half a percent on a three month annualized basis, it never stops there. The minimum additional increase is a percent and a half. Maybe it'll be different this time, but of course the first rule of Ironside's macro is it's never different this time. And that's what the Fed is missing here is we are at a point where any further weakening of demand and a financial market shock could cause a weakening of demand, by the way, in a whole negative feedback loop, which is the story of the yen carry unwind right now. It started with U.S. growth then translated into the drop in yen, and now it's becoming a negative feedback loop, which could actually impact the employment market in the US. We are at this negative point of convexity. So that was the next point. We then went on to discuss dynamism destruction and how the way the Fed conducted this policy reduced turnover in the labor market, which the first order effect was to bring down wages, but the second order effect is lower productivity over time. Again, the Fed thinks their policies mainly impact demand, and that may be true as a first order effect and in the short run, but in the inter intermediate term, it damages supply as well. And we illustrated that in the note by showing total new home sales relative to large builder orders and the, the big gap that's opened up that illustrates how small mom and pop builders are being strangled by this deeply inverted yield curve and the lack of credit and the price of credit coming from small banks. We then went and talked about the fiscal problem and how the employment cost index showed government wages running a full percent above private sector wages. That was not supposed to be the deal. The deal was supposed to be you work for the government, you got paid less, but you couldn't get fired. Now you get paid more and you can't get fired. So this is creating an intractable problem that monetary policy can't fix. Um, again, to our point that these problems uh, of an excessively interventionist fiscal uh, policy and monetary policy in the longer term part of the market are really big problems that we need to get away from in the coming years. Um, we talked about how the Fed is just getting started, how they're going to have to cut aggressively. That's becoming self-evident and how the growth scare is here with a vengeance. We thought the market, um, this recognition was worth at least 10 percent. And um, the problem we have right now, as I stated up front, is that um, uh, the timing is not right for the market to bottom here. The magnitude of the sell-off is pretty good. Our measures of uh, risk are at extreme levels, but the timing isn't great because the Fed is unlikely to react to this um, immediately and start the process of things getting better. And we think the data is likely to get worse before it gets better. Uh, we're worried about retail sales numbers next week, the big box retailer earnings, the first estimate of the benchmark revision, and then next month's payrolls all before we get to next month's Fed meeting. So um, buckle up. We've been we've been suggesting maintaining a lot of cash and you could start deploying it um, if you wish. But um, uh, picking bottoms is always difficult. Down 10 is good. Down 15 would be a little better. We would nibble away a little bit uh, as long as you did build up a big cash holding. Um, and that's where we're at right now. So we'll do our best to keep you up. Put some notes out through the course of the week 
and um, uh, you know little blurbs on on the chat service and all and um, um, you know thanks for listening Barry Knapp from Ironsides have a good week everyone thanks